Welcome to Mecha as Modern Mythology, my take on why I think the anime mecha genre offers a mythology and a particular take on the world for modern people. But before we go any further, quick spoiler warning, I will be talking a little bit about certain aspects of certain mecha series. Now, I'm not going to reveal exactly what happens in the end or any major plot twists, but there are certain people for whom simply saying that the protagonist of a series is still alive halfway through is an unacceptable spoiler. So I will be talking about that kind of level of stuff and basic premises and such, but no major plot threads. Um, also, this presentation will talk about um, certain darker themes, um, and uh, so just be aware of that. The reason I'm doing this, actually, is because I do a lot of presentations at various anime conventions, and a few years ago I was doing a panel on mythology and comparing the mythology of Japan and anime and the uh, mythology of the West and talking about shows like Gurren Lagann. And at the end there was a Q&A segment and a young man raised his hand and said, Gurren Lagann saved my life. And it turns out he wasn't joking, nor was he overstating the case. He had had a really rough childhood and he was in a really dark place, and then he watched Gurren Lagann. And that line, don't believe in you, believe in me, who believes in you, just hit him really hard, and he turned around, he got into a much better place in his life, he ended up helping his younger brother, and it really changed him as a person. At a very deep level, right? Not just in the way that a lot of other anime you know, speaks to us and we think about things. There's lots of anime out there that you know, speaks to us, but this got me thinking. You know, much as I respect the magical girl genre, you don't hear people saying, Madoka Magica made me want to live, right? Often quite the opposite. Um, and again, I, there's a lot of other anime that I love and deeply respect, but I don't hear them people talking about them saying it saved their life. Now, in fairness, that is one data point, right? Let's not overstate the importance of that one story. But it really got me thinking about what Mecha is and the stories it tells and what lessons those are providing for us. So let's talk about that a little bit. And before we go any further, we really have to address the two major subgenres of Mecha. There are the classic super robot Mecha, like Mazinger Z and Get a Robo back in the early days. This is a, um, a story of usually a young boy who gets gifted a giant robot by his, by some kind of you know crazy inventor, scientist, father figure, and uh, uses that to fight off Monsters of the Week. Right, very straightforward. And then you have the, what we call the real robot genre, and or subgenre rather, and this is the story of um, usually a much more realistic universe. The mecha are products of a military industrial complex. They are machines, like a tank or a jet. Um, they're more the stories are more grounded. They're about more multi-dimensional characters, so forth and so on. Uh, you know, we got the super robot stuff in the sixties and seventies primarily, and then uh, Gundam came along and created this sort of real robot subgenre. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Um, in the past decade or so, as of making this video, we've had shows like Gurren Lagann and Darling in the Franks, which take the super robot visual style and visual approach to mecha and fighting, um, but underneath the hood have characters and situations and plots that are much more like that of a real robot show. So that division is not quite as simple, um, but more importantly, when I talk about Super Robot in this, I'm talking about the Super Robot shows of the 60s and 70s, those early shows, in contrast to the more sophisticated shows, more complex shows of the modern day, as typified by the real robot genre. So this sort of mud mudding of the water is, is not as significant for what we're talking about here, right? Okay. Moving on. Um, what are Super Robot shows? Again, the shows of the 60s and 70s. They're basically power fantasies. Right? They're about a young man who's given this powerful weapon and uses it to fight off bullies. Right, Basically, evil aliens from Planet X who are bent on destroying and or enslaving humanity. And this is fine. 
right? There's nothing wrong with a story that is a power fantasy. We all like and want power fantasies um, at different points in our lives. Um, but as a result, the kinds of stories you can tell are somewhat limiting. The heroes defeat increasingly powerful bad guys, and note how they do that. Note that when a crisis occurs and the protagonist is hunkered down in his mecca as it's being beat on by the bad guy who is about to uh, you know, defeat the hero, and we cut to the inside of the, the mecha cockpit, and the hero's in there, and the music goes quiet, and we just hear like a heartbeat or the main character's heavy breathing as we hear this boom, 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 and the camera shakes as the fists of the bad guys, you know, mecha, are banging on the outside of the, the hero mecha. And then suddenly the hero remembers his mentor saying, don't worry, believe in yourself, you've got this, you have everything that you need to defeat the bad guy. And then suddenly, you know, the hero's eyes pop open, and the bad guy goes, nani? And the hero goes, no, like this, and there's the lines going behind him, and he defeats the bad guy, and the bad guy blows up, right, whatever. Note what happened there. The hero won by drawing on his own inner strength. The hero already has everything within him that he needs to defeat the bad guy, the villain. He doesn't need any outside help beyond the mecha itself. This means that the heroes of Super Robot shows generally don't grow significantly. Their personality, their behaviors in episode one are very similar to their personalities in episode 50. You know, they may have grown a little bit over the, the, the way. They may have learned a few lessons. They may have a little bit of the rougher edges filed off. But they aren't significantly different people at the end of that. They're not really changed as a result of what goes on because they had everything they, they needed within themselves. And again, this is not necessarily a bad thing. We benefit from stories that tell us that what we have inside is really what we need. You know, physician, heal thyself. Right? That's fine. But it is fundamentally kind of limiting. Super Robot shows are pure id. You know, bully shows up, we get a giant fist that we use to defeat the bully. Indeed, when we see darker themes get introduced into even the Super Robot genre with shows like Zambot 3 in the late 70s, um, that coincides with real robot coming up and not quite killing off the super robot genre, but it definitely faded away. And then when it reappeared later on in the 80s and 90s with stuff like the Brave franchise and Super Robot Wars, a lot of that darkness was scrubbed away. These are you know, very enjoyable super robot shows in quality in many ways, but they're not about... Um, those you know, this is not war in the pocket right um, there may be dark moments but they are fundamentally straightforward stories of heroes being heroic right and again nothing wrong with that so in review this is the basic structure right my half crazy inventor scientist father grandfather uncle whatever father figure gives me the solution to the big problem and i use that to save the world That sounds familiar. Oh yeah, right? <laughs> Star Wars. Lightsaber, father figure, all that kind of stuff. And indeed, Star Wars in general, and Episode Four in particular, is a very excellent example of mythological tropes. Those were written, George Lucas very much wrote those with classic mythological tropes in mind. This receipt of this powerful weapon or talisman is called the boon in um, in the idea of mythological storytelling. And to get into that, we need to get into questions of mythological structure, but that is the next video.